welcome to the University of Portsmouth, welcome to the Institute of Criminal Justice Studies and to what is our second virtual study day of this academic year. This particular virtual study day is focused primarily at our crime and criminology students and our policing and investigation students. But if you're doing one of our other degrees, or indeed if you're just an interested observer, you're most welcome to join us this morning. We're live here from now until midday today, and we'd really like you to get involved if you can. So please post your questions underneath the YouTube video, uh, and we will answer as many of them as we can live. If we can't answer them live, then we'll definitely get back to you at a later stage. So please do post any queries, questions, feedback, tell us about the weather where you are, whatever it is. Um, please just get involved and be in touch. So we've got quite a nice packed programme for you this morning. Uh, we've got some sessions on the investigation of crime with the course leader of policing investigation, Dr John Fox. Uh, we've got a session on the sociology of deviance uh, with the course leader of crime and criminology, Mark Jacobs. And we've also got some really useful sessions on writing better essays, uh, on referencing, uh, and also on writing your dissertation. So there's lots going on today. And we've got some additional videos and clips uh, to show you in between as well. So lots and lots going on. Uh, please do get involved as well on social media if you want to. We are on Twitter, we're on Facebook and we're on Instagram. Please use the hashtag ICJSVSD19. The hashtag is ICJSVSD19. And if you want to, please post us a photo of yourself or your location this morning while you're watching the virtual study day because there is a prize. The prize of a University of Portsmouth hoodie will be for what we consider to be the best photo of your location for the virtual study day. And we have a winner from the last virtual study day, uh, which was Leslie Thomas. And here's a picture of Leslie Thomas and her cat at the last virtual study day. So please post your photographs uh, this morning of where you are and you could be in with a chance of winning the prize. If you're not watching live, you're still welcome to send us your photos, but I'm afraid the hoodie may not be yours. Uh, so we're starting off today uh, with a session with Linda Jones. Linda from the library, our favourite librarian, uh, is going to be talking to us today about a very important matter uh, when writing and researching for your essays, and that is referencing. Mm. Morning, Linda. Good morning. Uh, now, the first question <coughs> that students often ask is when in the process of researching and writing for your essay should you start to think about referencing? Is it right at the very end when you've finished your essay? No. <laughs> <laughs> when would be a better time? Um, really and truly, it would be a better time to think about it before you even start. Yeah. Um, we do try to prepare people uh, for referencing so that we will send out this booklet, yes. uh, which gives you basic hints and tips and shows you how to reference almost any reliable source that you could come across. Mm. Um, and most people see it, think, I'll think about that later. Mm. And I must admit, I think probably today's uh, sessions are starting at the very lowest point because referencing does seem to cause more people, more problems than it is really justifiable. Mm. Um, and people get very angsty about it. Yes, they do. Um, I think uh, if you have had a long time out of education mm. and have forgotten about referencing, mm. that causes problems. But it can also be that you're starting for the very first time on serious academic research mm. and you've never considered referencing before. Um, and I can remember that um, when I was a student in a very dim, distant past. I spent a long time creating my own little colour coding system for my referencing, Ooh. simply because nobody had taught me how to do it. Yes. Um, and it didn't seem quite so uh, important in those mm. days. But now I think we do really recognise that this is a basic academic skill. Mm. However, it's not one that you learn in its entirety by reading a book clip. Mm. Um, it is very much one that you learn on the job yeah. and it is something which you should consider thinking of as an improving skill throughout your entire academic career. Mm. And I still do answer referencing queries from lecturers, so <laughs> it is throughout your whole academic career. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I think it's not aiming for perfection at your first attempt. Mm. 
but it is recognising the rules and thinking about how you apply them mm -hmm. every time that you actually start writing. Mm -hmm. But as I said, it's before you start writing because unless you collect the references as you are researching, mm -hmm. you are totally lost. Mm -hmm. um, the most frequent question I am asked in the library by students here on campus is, do you remember that big red book you found me? <laughs> and you don't, Linda. Um, well, sometimes <laughs> I can. <laughs> but there are a lot of big red books mm. in the library. Um, and I'm getting older, I think. <laughs> um, I used to, in a very small library, be able to identify a book if they could show me a photocopy of one page mm. of it. Nowadays, it is very, very much more difficult. And, of course, e-books look different from yeah, uh, so. print books. And with distance mm. learners, they're more likely to have been using print books. Mm. One handy tip is if you've used a print book, why not actually keep it on your bookshelf? Mm. It doesn't mean you're t keeping it away from anybody else to read, but it means that when you are worrying about what was that book, mm. you can go to your bookshelf and just test that is the book. Yeah, absolutely. So that guide that the library produce is mm. a very handy one to keep. Yes. On your desk, by your side. I have one by my side all the Excellent. time. Excellent. Okay. Now, Linda, as always on our sofa, no expense spared, we mm. have top five referencing errors Ooh. that we thought we would go through to see where people are generally going wrong and if you've got any advice on where they could avoid that. Mm. First of all, not understanding the purpose of a reference list. Right, at this point I draw on evidence from my own family. Um, I have had a great deal of experience in trying to teach my own son how to reference. I did actually manage very well with the whole of his football team apart from him <laughs> because he would never listen. Um, but his basic approach to referencing from the day that he started college was I'm going to impress the lecturer with how much I've read. Mm. And having a mother who was a librarian, he understood about library catalogues. So his biology essays would end with a complete list of every biology book that was in the library. <laughs> you would only have to go and check his library records to see that he'd never borrowed one of them. Mm. And it was very, very difficult to tell which ones he had read because quite often what he was doing was actually writing the essay from his lecture notes. Right. Um, lecturers do track references, mm. particularly if they feel a little bit worried about a particular argument or because they don't recognise the reference. Mm. So you are not there to impress with the amount you have read. You are there in the reference list trying to illustrate to your lecturer that you have read and understood mm. something which means that if it's in the reference list, it should be making a valid point within the essay and it should be referenced within the essay well. When you start actually just conglomerating a reference list, you quite often forget to put any reference in the essay to it mm -hmm. and it immediately shows up. Um, it just gives the impression that you're trying very hard but you don't really know what you're mm -hmm. doing. I think often students think that we ask them to provide a reference list just to be awkward. Mm. Whereas in actual fact, and we're all doing it as writers mm. at whatever stage we are, mm. because people need to know where we've got the information that we're talking about mm. so that we can verify that they're talking about the correct thing and they're talking about it correctly, but also so that the reader mm. can go and follow up that yes. reference themselves and find out more mm. information. And I think as well that a, a very narrow reference list and with some first year students what I see is a reference list that is entirely based on the textbook. Mm. Um, you're just showing that you've read one thing yes. and not that you've <coughs> explored it, investigated it, looked at other viewpoints. Mm. And remember, reference, uh, textbooks do have their own reference lists yes, which you can follow up on. And if you go from something like a textbook to a slightly more complex source, so because I do law and criminology, quite often textbooks refer you to cases. Mm. Uh, if you can reference a case as well, that's great. Mm. If you can reference an article that's been written since the reference book was published, mm. you're likely to get a newer viewpoint. Mm. So there are lots of tricks that you can use to find 
not better sources, but different sources which might expand your understanding. Absolutely. Because it's all about, when you're writing essays, it's all about, isn't it, the gathering of lots of different viewpoints, lots of different evidence, mm. and then putting your argument together. Yes. And making it seem seamless. Yes. That's the aim. Right. So we now understand the purpose of a reference list. Number two, referencing errors. Oh, who would do that, Linda? Not using referencing at Portsmouth. Um, partly it's because people don't realise it's there. Right, tell us what it is. The purple R on the library <laughs> website, mm. underneath it lurks an enormous amount of information. It will not do your referencing for you. No. Um, and I am a total advocate of not adopting uh, automated referencing schemes until you actually understand how the referencing system that you are using works. Mm. Because otherwise, you will produce something that looks vaguely OK, and a lecturer can tear it to pieces mm. because you ha actually haven't taken account of punctuation and things like mm. that. So referencing at Portsmouth will give you a drop-down menu approach where you can say, I'm reading a book, I want to reference that book, mm. um, the book's uh, a printed book, mm. the book's an electronic book, and you go through those sets of choices until you basically get down to exactly what it is you're reading. Um, and at the bottom, there will a link will appear which will take you to advice on exactly how to reference it. And what I really like about referencing, of course, because I use it all of the time, as everybody should, is that it not only tells you how to reference it in the reference list, and it provides you with an example, which is really handy, it also tells you how to, ref how to cite it within the essay yes. as well, yes. doesn't it? Yes, and the in-text citation is, again, a bit of a worry, particularly with students who are coming back to academia or are actually starting for the first time and have never, ever before felt the iron grip of the word count. Mm. Um, so it does illustrate ways of incorporating your reference in using the minimum word count, mm. as well as doing it in a rather formal, automatic way, which actually does tend to increase your word mm. count. So incorporating the reference into sentences <laughs> yeah. is definitely something that, perhaps not in your first essay, but certainly on your second, trying to do because it helps reduce the word count a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So the big R on the library website is where everyone needs to go. You mentioned books, but it covers an enormous range it of other things, it? It would do absolutely everything, including things which really say that you don't need to be referencing them, like... Um, unofficial correspondence, yeah. telephone calls. Mm. Uh, but it will cover all those things, radio programmes, absolutely anything you want. Lovely. Thank you very much. Number three, not collecting all of the necessary information. Right. Now, that's what I was saying about starting before mm. you start to write. It is collecting that information. If you're using an e-book, it's exactly like a print book, and you can look behind the title page and it'll give you all the publication details. Mm. If you've borrowed a print book from the library and returned it and mm. then decided that you are going to reference it, it becomes more difficult. Mm. But do remember that the library catalogue does actually show every book we own mm. complete with its publication details. Mm. So, so long as you've captured the page number, you should be able to retrace your steps. Yeah. Um, it's also important to look at journals and journal articles and look at the way that they are referenced mm. um, and take on board the fact that journals can have very similar titles yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Criminology is actually one of the worst subject yeah. areas because <laughs> there are very few words that yeah. appear in criminology journal titles. And you need to remember quite a lot of information, don't you? I always mm. get caught out with journal articles because I forget to write down the page numbers. Yes. So I then have to go back afterwards, which is quite frustrating. Yeah. But I think when students are writing notes before they write up their essay, it's a good idea at that stage to write all of the details down that you need, yes. then write the notes, and then you've got it all in one place. And you? for distance learners, I really do... Uh, recommend that for journal articles, if you found it, save it. Mm. Um, don't go looking for it again. Yeah. Actually start building yourself up folders of material mm. because what you use in your first year 
quite surprising will sometimes appear as something that's just a, an extra point Absolutely. in your final dissertation. Yeah. So it's worth saving what you've yeah. got. And it's another way of getting value for money from your fees. Yeah. You're going away with your own private library. Exactly, lovely. Yeah, so organisation is key, isn't it? Yes. That one? Right, number four, not recognising different types of sources. Ah, yes. Then this is the email I always get with a web link mm. saying, how do I reference this? Mm. And the very first thing you've got to do is identify what it is. Sometimes when you identify what it is, you might decide not to reference it. Yes. Um, websites, for instance. Websites appear in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some are very authoritative. Uh, we have lots of government websites, mm. which will give you a great deal of guidance about policy, developments, may give you stats, all the rest of it. But there are an enormous number of websites that are created by minority interest groups with actually not very much knowledge, mm. uh, with a particular bias, and you're going to have to investigate them really thoroughly before you start using them as evidence. Yeah. Um, so online is a particular danger area yeah. for finding things. Yeah. I think sometimes students think, oh, I, I shouldn't be citing anything online, but that's not the case. There are no. some, you've just got to be a little bit more savvy, haven't you, about checking the reliability of the source before mm. you use it. If I had been a little cleverer before mm. I arrived here, I should have sent you a link for a video to show during today's sessions. Um, one of my colleagues went to visit the Houses of Parliament last week, and she came back with some really good resources about official documentation. Mm. Uh, I'm sure lots of students would like information from places that show no political bias. Mm. You wouldn't necessarily think of going to Parliament for that. Uh, but there is a House of Commons and a House of Lords Library mm. who employ enormous hordes of researchers and they provide something called research briefings and they are totally unbiased. Yes. Really uh, useful. And really great background for Absolutely. almost anything. Yeah. Um, there's a lovely little video which explains their motivations and why they do it, uh, brilliant. which we appears which appears on the subject page. But we I will send the link. That with our students. That would be brilliant. Um, but okay. that is something which is immediately identifiable as a high quality yeah. source, and it's getting those high quality sources. If you investigate Parliament independently, mm. what I tend to find is that I'm being asked to. Uh, help someone reference evidence to a House of Commons committee. The evidence actually hasn't achieved anything apart from give one person's viewpoint no. or one body's viewpoint. So it's a little bit yeah. dodgier yeah. in terms of fact. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, we'll finish with the final one, which is just very importantly, don't give up. Uh, we've got library support. We've Contact got, the library. <laughs> we've got the live chat, haven't we, on the website. Yes. Uh, and, of course, referencing reports, which is really handy as well. Thank you very much again, Linda. That was really, really helpful in terms of how to do better references. Now, for those who weren't able to make it for our induction event in September, and indeed for those that were there and need a refresher, here is my take on what is currently important in the world of policing. <laughs> What's interesting, I think, about policing at this moment is that we really are in unique times, uh, and um, this is a unique time for British policing at the moment. After a very sustained period of investment in the police service in England and Wales, we've recently seen budgetary cuts of around 22% in real terms between 2010 and 2016. And this is amounted to a budget reduction of £2.2 billion. Pounds. And in terms of workforce reductions, what this has meant is a loss of 37,400 staff in the five years between 2010 and 2015. And that's a 12% reduction in police officers and a 20% reduction in police staff. What's interesting about these massive reductions in budgets and in staff themselves is that both the coalition government and the conservative government that followed them have both argued that actually the police have seen an increase in funding during this time. Unsurprisingly, these claims have been rebuked by the statistics authority, uh, and on both times that uh, the coalition and the Conservatives have made these claims, they have said that actually, as we all know, there has been a decrease in funding rather than an increase. 
Additionally, and recently, we've seen a report published by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary into the efficiency, effectiveness and legitimacy of the police service, and they have highlighted a deep red warning flag over various aspects of policing, including, worryingly, investigation and neighbourhood policing. And apparently the Metropolitan Police have been described by the Commissioner as nearing financial breaking point. Now, one reason for the concerns about police funding relate to an increase in both the complexity and also the demands that are being placed on the police service at the moment. Now, what we know about crime, and we were discussing this with the new students on the distance learning degrees yesterday, what we know is that crime has been falling quite dramatically in some cases since the mid-1990s and now remains relatively stable. But what the data hides amongst that is the enormous variation that we've seen within separate crime categories and also the emergence of new forms of crime that we've previously not taken account of. So what we know is that more traditional acquisitive crimes, such as burglary, for example, have been on the decline since the mid-1990s. But we know that crimes involving violence and crimes involving uh, and sexual offences have been on the rise. And we also know, as Mark has mentioned and as Lisa will be mentioning, that there has been a rise in fraud and cybercrime as well. Now, all of this has inevitably meant that there will be a change in demand upon policing services. What we have seen is a reduction in demands to 999 calls. We've seen a 23% reduction in 999 calls to the police. But what this doesn't take into account is the complexity of what the police are dealing with and the harms that are now coming to the attention of the police. So we've seen a change in both the response from the police and also we've seen a change in the focus from the police as well. And what we're seeing is a move away in the focus of the police from high volume crime and trying to reduce levels of high volume crime. We've seen a move away from that and a move towards low volume but high harm offences. So we're moving towards low volume but high harm offences. And these have remained relatively hidden from the public gaze. And the examples of those would be things like child sexual exploitation, domestic and sexual abuse, human trafficking, organised crime and terrorism. So the activities that the police are now involved with are very much more focused on managing those harms, managing those risks, threats and vulnerability as well. But a concentration on crime actually neglects to consider another growing area of police demand. The College of Policing estimate that non-crime related incidents now make up 83% of calls to command centre call centres. 83% are now non-crime related. And they also estimate that public safety and welfare incidents are now the largest category of reported incidents to the police by far outweighing the number of crime and antisocial behaviour calls. So what this demonstrates is that demand from the policing organisation is going in two directions. On the one hand, we've got a more complex and largely hidden area of low volume but high harm offences, those examples that I just gave you. But on the other hand, we're seeing a move towards a high volume of non-crime related activities that the police are also being asked to get involved with. So what we're seeing, I would argue, is a bifurcation of policing activities with the low volume but high harm and largely hidden crimes, but also the huge volume as well of these non-crime related calls that police are also being asked to attend to. I've recently finished some research asking new recruits to the police service over the course of the first four years of their careers what their views on policing are on a whole range of issues. And I also asked them what they felt that were the challenges to the police service at the moment. And they argued very strongly that there were two areas that they felt were challenges to the police service currently. And they felt this was particularly the case given the fact that they had such limited resources at the moment. And those limited resources, they felt, were being used to support other parts of not only the criminal justice system, but also the social services system that they felt really that others should be involved with. The two areas that they were most concerned about were firstly missing people. Officers were very frustrated about the amounts of time they were having to spend with missing people. They understood the concerns about sexual exploitation that is connected with missing people. But there was also a frustration, really, that required the statutory reporting of missing teenagers, particularly older teenagers from residential care, when there were no risks attached to it, when they were just late home uh, from an evening out. Apparently, according to the National Crime Agency, that type of work has increased 25% over the last five years. And there was also a frustration from the police in the amount of uh, 
er issues around mental illness that they were dealing with, that they felt were the responsibility of other parts of the, of the system. Research estimates that 20% of police officers' time is now accounted for by mental illness. And that rises to 40% if you include vulnerable people more generally. And this is a concern of uh, HMIC in particular, and Tom Windsor, the Chief Inspector of HMIC, is regularly talking about the police now being used as the first resort for mental illness rather than the last resort. So if we've got this bifurcation of policing activities, this needs to call really for a close consideration of what we want from the police, what we expect the role of the police to be. Now, according to the work of Police Foundation, the effectiveness of the police relates very closely to what the public expect and what the public want the police to achieve. And the Police Foundation point to two schools of thought in this regard. Do we want the police to be focused on crime reduction? Is that their main role? Is it about what works? Or do we want the police to be more focused on legitimacy? This focus would be much more on the social legitimacy of the police. This would be measured through public confidence, and it would also be focused much more on the principles of community policing. And their research, it was a four-year action research, actually suggested that it was the latter, that the police should be concentrating on issues around social legitimacy of what they're doing, building links with the community, rather than trying to concentrate much more on reducing crime. When I asked the new recruits over the course of the first four years what they felt the role of the police was, I got some very interesting answers. And they tended to fall into three different categories. First, they talked about their role associated with crime, fighting crime, apprehending offenders, making arrests, gathering evidence, sort of traditional police work that we would think to be associated with the police. The second area that they talked about related to much more public service sentiments, about public protection, about visibility, about reassurance. And the third area pointed to a much more recent aspect of police work, which was about helping, safeguarding vulnerable people. What was interesting was over the course of the four years how their views on what the role of the police was changed over that time. When I first interviewed them as new police officers, the role was all associated with fighting crime. It was all associated with apprehending offenders and making arrests. But by the time I spoke to them after four years in the job, 85% of the statements that they made about what their role was concerned about related to vulnerability and safeguarding. This had only been 16% in the few, first few weeks when I spoke to them, but went up to 85% after four years. So much of the role, of, particularly of new recruits to the police service, of younger constables in service, is around these issues of vulnerability and safeguarding. So there's little doubt that public service cuts that we've seen have impacted on the police significantly. This bifurcation of policing activities calls for a sort of better understanding and a clearer understanding of what we need to do about the police role and what we want the police to do. As I said, the Police Foundation talked about those two different roles. Is it about reducing crime, where the police really are being asked to win an unwinnable war, which is get rid of crime, and they're being asked to do it with pretty unworkable tools, which is the power of arrest. Or actually, are we asking the police to do something different? Are we asking the police to uh, concentrate much more on their social legitimacy? And what uh, the procedural justice literature tells us is that actually what's important to the public is not necessarily the outcomes of the justice process, but it's the processes and the legitimacy of the processes that take place that lead up to that. And that would mean viewing policing in a different way, in a much less quantifiable way, but actually looking much more about public opinion and issues around that. So a change in focus to look at the more social and cultural aspects of policing would require a whole change of thought because it's not something that the police service concentrates on and it's not something that the government concentrates on. And that, I suppose, is a challenge for both. Thank you. Welcome back. We're joined on the sofa now by Dr John Fox, who is the course leader of the Policing and Investigation degree. So inevitably, John, we're going to be talking about mm. investigation. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you all. So we're going to be talking about uh, the investigation of crime, and in particular what measures have been taken in recent years to prevent miscarriages of justice. Mm. But let's, before we do that, what is a miscarriage of justice? Oh, that's a good question, and, and many people, I think, automatically think, oh, when someone's sent to prison and they haven't done something wrong. And that's really one aspect. But justice um, is something that affects victims and offenders and, and defendants. So if a crime's not been investigated properly, properly and someone's got away with 
a crime that they've committed, that's a miscarriage of justice in respect of the victim. Mm. Um, the other thing I think that people get a bit um, hung up about is when a court case is overturned and it's then branded a miscarriage of justice. And it, actually, that's not a good way of looking at things often because it might just mean that the conviction was unsafe for mm. technical reasons. Now, I'm perfectly happy with that. We have what's called a due process criminal justice system, which actually means that the bar to convict anybody is quite high. Mm. Um, and it's hard to convict people in this country. But the fact that someone has had their conviction quashed or overturned by the appeal court doesn't necessarily mean they didn't commit the crime. Mm. It might mean that there was some flaw in the, the evidence gathering, they didn't have a fair trial. And I think a good example of that that's often quoted in, in essays, and I, I'm, uh, I'm marking a module at the moment, um, for um, critical issues in public protection policing, which is a level six unit that some of the students might be doing. And some people were talking about the Sally Clark case, mm. which, and she was a woman who was convicted of killing two of her children. A couple of appeals, and then on the second appeal at the appeal court, she was uh, acquitted. Now, the fact is, we don't know whether Sally Clark killed her children or not, and we never will do now because she's dead. But at the time, there was no doubt that a pathologist failed to disclose a test result relating to one of the babies, mm -hmm. which could have indicated that that child had um, a disease. So whether or not she killed the children, I have no doubt that she did not have a fair trial because mm -hmm. that information should have been available to her and it should have been tested as, as to the plausibility of it. So that's what I think we need to think about with miscarriages of justice. It's not just where someone's languishing in prison mm. for something they didn't do. It can be either when a police investigation has not found the guilty party and they've got away with it, mm. or when there is some flaw in the system that meant that the person didn't have a fair trial and therefore their conviction was unsafe. Mm. How's that? Yeah, brilliant. So we, in this country, we've had uh, a long history of quite high-profile miscarriages of justice. Yep. What has happened in more recent years to try to address some of those problems? Perhaps identify as well, if you can, what some of those problems were. Well, someone as young as me, you know, I wouldn't be calling this recent, um, but in the 80s and the 70s, there were um, quite serious cases. I mean, a, the Confay case really is something that all students doing criminal justice ought to have a, a li little bit of knowledge around. And, and the Confay case, um, was about a, a, a chap who was a homeless guy in a, in a derelict house. Two or three young boys went in, I think they were about 14. They set fire to the house and eventually they were arrested and they were interrogated for the murder of this homeless guy. Now, they were convicted and it turned out later on because some, luckily a lawyer took up this case and was very disturbed by the way the interviews were conducted. It came um, out that they had had little protection. The police had bullied the boys. They'd actually got their parents to, they, they bullied the parents to try and elicit a confession from these boys. So all of the kind of safeguards that we now take for granted were not in place in the Confay case. And that led to um, a, a, a lot of disquiet um, when these convictions were overturned. A judge called Lord Fisher was asked to do a review into it. He was very unhappy with the way the police were interviewing people. That led to another um, Royal Commission, which eventually led to a part of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984. Mm. And Code C of that act is all about how we treat um, people who are detained and how mm. we question them. So all of that can be traced back to the Confay case, really. Mm. I'm not saying that was the only trigger, but that was one of the main triggers. So anyone who's writing about miscarriages about interviewing yeah. currently ought to really trace the journey back to that sort of case in the 70s where mm -hmm. things were going wrong. Uh, also in the 70s we had um, some high profile IRA trials and the Guildford Four is a good example where I think it's pretty fair to say now that the police um, did engage in some malpractice there. They, they they tricked somebody into uh, confessing by, by writing out a statement on a form and then they took it into an interview room and said to one of the co-suspects your mates just confessed here you know you may as well tell us everything now and mm. the, they, they they tricked 
Now, you can't do that. Um, whatever people think about, well, it's fair game, it is not. And in our system here, we don't do that kind of thing. And therefore, that again brought this whole idea of interviewing into disrepute, which again fed into this idea of having much more stringent safeguards around how we interview suspects. And the final case, which I think students need to look at around this area, is the Cardiff Three. And the interesting thing about that is that that case uh, was investigated after PACE came in. Mm. And just a small bit of trivia here, okay? Um, although it's called the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, it actually wasn't enacted for a further two years. Am I boring you here? No, I know this one. It's good. Yeah? You sure? Am I boring that? <laughs> Not at all. Right. It actually came in in 2000, sorry, 1986. So there was a small period of time, a couple of years, where although PACE appears to have been in, it wasn't. So anybody who's talking about a case in 1985 yeah. needs to remember that this is actually before PACE was enacted because mm. it took a while for all of the equipment to be set up. What did PACE bring? It brought a safeguard such as all interviews with the police now and suspects would be uh, recorded in some mm. way. And originally they were tape recorded and much of the time now they're done on DVD. So the Cardiff Three case is a great example there whereby although it I think happened in the 1988 or nine when these people were interviewed. So Pace was well and truly in. Yeah. The fact that Pace had come in gave an appeal court judge the opportunity to retrospectively go back and see how the interviews were conducted. Mm. So what happened here is that some people were wrongfully convicted, and I know that for sure, and I'll come to why in a moment. It got through the Crown Court trial, even though the interviews were very oppressive. The interviewers, the, the police, were you know, leering over the, the, the suspects, shouting at them, mm. constantly haranguing them for, for many, many hours. Um, the Crown Court judge accepted that those interviews were fair, and the people got convicted. Mm. Only on an appeal later did the appeal court judges have another listen to the tapes, and they thought, hang on a minute, we're not having this, this mm. is awful. So they, they then overturned the convictions. Now, two things. We now know for sure that they didn't do it, because someone was later caught and uh, DNA proved that they killed the victim, Lynette White. Mm. Okay? So that's why I'm safe sitting here saying that this was, without doubt, a miscarriage yeah. of justice. But the other thing that's important is it was only because of Pace coming in with this requirement to tape record the interviews that anyone ever knew what had gone on in, on in that room. Mm. So I just think that, what was your question by the way? <laughs> Something about miscarriages. Yeah. You know, that's, that's where I think we've, we've really raised our game in this country to ensure that not only um, will there not be as many miscarriages because of, of uh, interview. And let me just say a thing about the police. You know, I'm, I'm not wanting to sound too harsh about the police. They don't want to wrongfully convict people. Mm. There's no value in that to the police, mm. is there? You know, they don't want to just put someone in prison. I mean, I hope not, because that means that whoever did commit the crime is still out there doing mm. whatever. But there are times when people do confess to things for all sorts of reasons when they haven't done it. In, and the police can in themselves become victims of that. Yeah. Um, so for all sorts of reasons, this idea of of recording, having transparency in the interview room is good. Mm. And it, it allows people to retrospectively go and check out were things done in a fair way. Yeah. So most of the developments were around the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and around interviewing. Were there any other aspects? I think a huge development in reducing miscarriages. Mm. Well, I kind of linked to it really. When I was talking about the Sally Clark case, um, a pathologist, a home office pathologist, got a test result back from one of the two boys that had died. And it indicated that the boy had some sort of, um, uh, it's a disease, I can't, it's called SA, stachyorophophilus or something. Mm. And um, he found that because the, he thought the bug was in the lumbar, uh, the cerebrospinal fluid of the child. Now, when he, s when he got the result back from the lab, he was convinced that the child did not actually have it. And I I'm guessing now, but I think he thought that he may have contaminated the needle. So if you, if you take the lumbar puncture um, fluid and if you put the needle onto the mortuary table, which is full of bugs mm. and disgusting stuff, you wouldn't want to eat a dinner on it, I'm sure. Um, it, 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 if he t put the tip of the needle on the table, it had picked up the bug. If he then squeezed the fluid into the mm. little jar, sent it off to the lab, 
he's contaminated the sample and the result came back from the lab indicating that this boy had a disease which the pathologist was sure the boy didn't have for mm. some reason. So he buried it. And without a doubt, that was unfair because the defence should have known about that. Indeed, the prosecution didn't know about it, so the CPS had no idea. Mm. And I everybody would have had a chance to test that to see whether, in fact, the child did have the disease. But by the time it came out five years later, the body had been cremated and it was all too late. So this is a, a, an example of a failure to disclose yeah. important information to both sides. Mm. And I think this is the other key piece of legislation that, that I want to highlight, apart from PACE, which is probably the, the number one, but this legislation that came in in 1996 called the Criminal <laughs> Procedure and Investigation Act. And it gave a duty on the police initially to reveal to the Crown Prosecution Service any material that they had in their possession mm. which they weren't planning to use in, as part of a trial. So, you send um, stuff away to one expert in entomology, the, the study of insects, mm. and say, you know, we want you to tell us when you think the body died that we found and got all these bugs from. This is disgusting. Isn't it? <laughs> They send a report back which indicates that the body had been in situ for three weeks. Mm. Okay? The police think, no, it can't have been there for three weeks because we've got two witnesses that walked that way and knew, said that the body wasn't there. So that report now is a, a bit of a nuisance. Mm. It's inconvenient. So in the past, before CPIA came in, it was possible for the police just to sort of bin that mm. and pretend it didn't exist. Now, that may affect any defence that comes up later on. If someone is eventually um, caught and arrested, maybe the fact that a, a, an expert had given it, it some indication that the body had been in situ for a long time may affect their defence because they may have an alibi for five weeks ago. Does that make sense? Mm. So now, anything like that that the police have in their possession or they're aware of its existence, they cannot just hide it and bury it. They have to reveal it to the CPS yeah. and the CPS then will make a decision whether to disclose it to the defence. And we've got a video on that actually from, that Marika um, really? talked. Marika Henneberg talked about uh, disclosure in England and Wales uh, at the recent Great. studies induction event. So yeah. we can make sure that our students can get that. John, I'm going to have to rush you because we've only got less than a minute left. But we have got a comment that's come in from Flippy who says the breach of pace in the Chris Halliwell case is interesting. Yeah. It led to the location of a victim. However, as you recall, the actions surrounding the officer involved, very, very briefly, how do you feel about that? He breached pace, and he had to make a decision. I mean, this is a very good case study. Again, one of my modules has got this as a, as a question in the, um, for, the, for the essays. Um, that detective superintendent, Steve Fulcher, knew full, full well that he was breaching pace, and he made the decision initially that the victim uh, may be alive. So this is the, the victim that the taxi driver took from Swindon. Now... Okay, you could argue that that was fair enough. She'd only been missing for a couple of days. So I think on that occasion, it was justified that he breached pace and did what was called an emergency interview mm. in order to find the body. Where it all went wrong is that as he was at the scene in Savonake Forest, where Halliwell was showing him where the, that body was found, I can't remember, I mean, I don't know the full conversation, but it was something along the lines of the offender said, do you want another one? Mm. Now, at that point... Once the officer knew that this was not a recent murder, mm. he was out on a limb then. And he, instead of saying, no, don't tell me now, we'll go back to the police station, we'll put you on tape and do it properly, he probably should have done that. Mm. He didn't, he let the guy ramble on and the, 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 the Halliwell said, oh, there was a body I buried 15 years ago in Gloucester. So they bimbled off to find that body. Now that was what the whole um, saga was about, really. Mm. And in the end, it got thrown out yeah. of so court. But in the end, the, you know, let's just finish the story because although it was initially thrown out, Halliwell was convicted of murder number one, but mm. not number two. So the family of number two were very annoyed. Uh, Steve Fulcher lost his job effectively uh, because of all of this. And in the end, they did another investigation. They went to Halliwell's house, found a spade which had been sat in his garage for 15 years with the soil which identically matched the Gloucester site. Mm -hmm. So in the end, Halliwell was convicted of the second mm. murder by proper means. Yeah, but there was a Great breach case. of pace in the meantime. But an interesting case, yeah. no doubt, for our students. John, a knowing you. breach of pace. Not, not an accident, not corruption. He knew what he was doing, and he yeah. made a decision. It's more important, actually, to get justice here for the families yeah. than to worry about the law. 
that's a whole interesting discussion as well. It is, isn't it? and I wouldn't want to be in his position. Yeah. I Thank have you. I have a lot of sympathy for him, but also the family who, at the time, did not get justice. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, John. We could have talked about that for a we lot can. longer. Uh, we will do it again another time. Now, Alexandra Hemingway is a careers advisor with our Careers and Employability Service here at the University of Portsmouth. In these two short videos, Alexandra discusses how to write a skills-based CV and some tips about applying for international jobs. <laughs> is telling you about how to make a skills-based CV. Now the commonest and probably most familiar way to organise a CV is more or less chronologically, but an alternative is to use the employer's main requirements as the main structure for your CV, especially focusing the first page on this. And this is often called a skill-based CV structure. You might then set out headings that match the employer's wish list. So I'd say six or seven is really the maximum you can realistically cover and under each add a few bullet points outlining examples of where your experience dovetails with what's been asked for. And then the second page would briefly outline the factual details about what, where and when for each of your various experiences. I've used this technique to good effect myself both long ago when I had little direct experience for the jobs I wanted and recently with more jobs under my belt than I can fit in details for. And in the early days I concentrated on transferable skills and how I'd previously demonstrated them. You do need to be really concise with the context though, otherwise you waste a lot of space on when I worked at ABC company as a random worker. And nowadays I would use a really similar approach, I just have many more examples to choose from. On the second page, as well as making room for sections like interests and references, I didn't go into detail for any individual experience, but created a relevant experience section, or you could call it career history or whatever you prefer, and there simply listed the facts of what, where and when of my previous roles in reverse chronological order. And the reason I didn't need to give any more detail than that is that I'd picked out the very best elements from across my experiences and organised them on page one under the headings the employer had provided. I knew what they were interested in and made it easy for the reader to match up what I'd done with what they were looking for. And this is the beauty of a skills-based CV. Remember, you don't need to tell the employer everything about every job, and even if you wanted to, there's never enough space. So you just need to make sure you tell them something convincing about each item they've asked for. So to sum up, whether you're just starting out, working towards a career change, or lucky enough to have too much experience to fit into two pages, your best bet is to give priority to the elements that the employer can use. The requirements of the new job should always be your focus, instead of aiming to explain everything you've done in the past. When you press for space, ask yourself, how does this line, or these few words, depending, match with the advertised requirements? And if it will help the selector tick off something that they're looking for, you make space for it. If it's something wonderful that you're really proud of, but it doesn't relate to anything on the employer's list, you may need to let it go and give priority to something else instead. But if you're less pressed for space, then obviously all of that bonus information that complements the listed requirements is entirely welcome. And I hope this will help you with the hard process of editing the CV. You can find examples and more information about skills-based CVs on our website and on Prospect's website. In both cases, look under the Careers Advice section to find the CV information. I'm going to be talking about how you can enhance your CV for international opportunities. And there may be students among you who are keen to look at international opportunities because your home country is outside the UK or just because you want to move to a new location. Which can be tricky if you want to go somewhere that you don't already have a network of informants or, or, and or direct cultural knowledge. Fortunately there is a great resource to get you started. We've invested in a license for going global and your usual uni login will work for this and you can find it via Working Globally page uh, under Careers Advice on our website. This is a database of useful information for people job hunting around the globe, like it sounds. And while I'm sure it's not completely perfect and foolproof, you know, I'm good, but I don't know all the conventions for every location in the world, it's a great starting point if you want to head to New Frontiers. There are country profiles as well as a selection of city profiles for key locations. Uh, and it's an American-made resource, so there's really good coverage in that area. 
And in each case, there are conventions around CVs and covering letters and other aspects of the initial written application, as well as a selection of job hunting websites for the location uh, with opportunities of all kinds. And to wrap it up, there's also cultural and visa information to get you started. However, you must always check with the relevant country's embassy in your home country to get the most up-to-date and complete information. So it's a really great way to see what could be out there for you and how best you can tackle your job hunt. Welcome back. I'm joined on the sofa now by Gordon Scruton. Good morning. Morning. And we're going to be talking today about one of my favourite subjects, which is writing better essays. Is, is your, one of your favourite subjects? It is, definitely. Now, it's last time we met on the yeah. sofa, I had just finished a rather large batch of marking, so I yes. may have been a bit cross. Um, but also, I was quite enthused about the things, enthused yeah. may be the wrong word, about the things that students were doing yeah. wrong, because I could see that there were some common errors, you must see this all of the time, some common errors that all, a lot of students yeah. were committing it's yeah I mean one of the things is that they are common errors they are relatively easily fixed yeah um, with a little bit of effort and one of the things which I think I I didn't realize when I was an undergraduate myself I was very guilty of this was that I, a lot of the feedback does transfer from, mm. from uh, assignment to assignment um, I, I don't know about you, about you but when I was an undergraduate I certainly kind of had that right I've got the feedback for this particular piece of work. There's the, there's the mark. Am I happy with it? Yes, no, whatever. There's the feedback, fine. Moving on to the next one. And mm. that feedback I received for the previous assignment never entered my head again. Yes, yeah. Um, I now realise that was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I say to students at the end of every year, you know, when they've got that gap mm. in the summer, it's a really good opportunity to actually look at all of the comments from the whole yeah. year because they will start to see patterns emerging. Well, I try to get them to do that during the... Yeah. During the year, to be to be honest, because um, the yeah, it, it's it's a, just a matter of um, statistical probability, really. Mm. If if the last three assignments you've had have said that you that you're doing this wrong, the next assignment you're putting together is probably going to have that error mm. as well, unless you specifically focus on fixing it. Yeah, um, and if so people yeah. don't know how to fix it, no, they can absolutely. They yeah, can I mean, that's that's one of the, that's one of the key things. It's like first of all, you, you you've got to recognise the issues that. Uh, you've got, mm. identify whether that is an issue which you feel relatively confident fixing yourself, Yeah. or if you don't feel particularly confident, don't suffer in silence. Absolutely. Uh, there's a whole load of support, and um, I guess I'd be one of the first along with the uh, marker, um, they can yeah. always get in touch with the marker, um, or their personal tutor if they want to do, but in terms of academic skills, it would be me. Yeah. yeah. And Gordon is just here for you, for yes. our ICJS students. Yeah. So please, do get in touch with him. Now, you'd be disappointed if I didn't have a cardboard <laughs> board at this moment. So here we are. This, well, this is, is like a memory test now. I'm trying this to is the answer <laughs> to everyone's problems on yeah. how to write better essays. Yeah. Let's start with number one. Yeah. Okay. Use more and better evidence. So how... I guess I want to start with a small question to you. How, do, from what you remember from the, all the marking you were doing, how mm. much were you saying this? An awful lot. And I was saying it to the students who were scoring quite low marks. Yeah. I was saying it to the students who were scoring quite high marks mm -hmm. because I think this one is relevant for everybody. Mm -hmm. You can, is this correct? You can never read too much, really. You can never research too much. No, you you just can run never, out of time. yes, absolutely. Yeah. You can never explore too much. No. And I think that the more evidence that you've got, to support the arguments that you're making, yeah, the yeah. better your essay is going to be. Because if you're relying on one or two sources that aren't great, then you're going to have one particular angle. Yeah. But if you can look at a range of sources that show the nuances of arguments and that they're good quality, so the better bit as well. Yes, we need to talk about the, the better. We need to, I think we need to talk about the hierarchy of evidence in terms of quality. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is that your peer-reviewed uh, articles in the journals mm. that's basically your gold standard yeah um your textbooks provide a good sort of foundational knowledge mm. and if you wanted definitions of classicism or about the the, the definitions of of um positivist criminology that mm. sort of thing then you'd go to a textbook you wouldn't go to the uh, a journal article um but those two are really where you get started and then mm. then you've you know 
other information is, is available elsewhere um, and is sometimes necessary. Sometimes you do need to go to the newspapers, but we go to the newspapers to see what the newspapers are saying about it, not to understand in general yeah. that subject, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And Linda and I were talking about this this morning, actually, yeah. when we were talking about referencing and using, and not seeing the internet as, as just a lot yeah. of dodgy sites, but actually there's a lot of useful stuff mm -hmm. out there, but just being a bit careful about what you use. Yeah, she yeah. was talking this morning about House of Commons briefing reports, which are yes. fabulous because they've yeah. got loads of really good information. Yeah, yeah. So journal articles are fantastic. They're short, they're to the point. They are very specific, which is yeah. great. But, you know, I have no problem with textbooks either no. because they're really useful particularly for our level four students and sometimes level five students yeah. when they want to get a, an understanding of the basics of a, I, of did, a topic. I mean I, I have seen marking recently for level six work where reliance on the textbooks has been kind of frowned on uh, or at least reliance on the textbooks is not necessarily it, it's, it's where an entire paragraph has been supported by Nubo, mm. for example yes. well, that, that's your key text in level four yeah that you, you shouldn't still be relying on that when you're producing level six work, that, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. The more um, the more evidence um, uh, that kind of speaks to making sure that you're backing up backing up what you're saying with uh, with supporting citations, multiple citations where at all possible. Mm. Uh, you you know do you, you, you if you can support the point you're making with two. Mm. Uh, sources or three sources is better than supporting it with just one. Yeah, and students don't need to say Brown has said this, White has no, said this. Absolutely. They can say the point. Yeah. And then in brackets you can put the three. References. Yeah, you don't need to be repeating. Sen you don't need a, yeah. a separate sentence for every single no. citation or, or source of evidence. Yeah. But it just shows that there is agreement out there mm. from the academic community about the point that you're making, and yes. that is great because that is enhancing. Yeah. Absolutely. Your evidence base. Well, that's, sure, that's, that's beginning to touch on one of the things which certainly level five, level six uh, students need to start focusing on a bit more is the critical analysis. Yes. That shows critical analysis when you can show that it's not just one person agreeing, it's two, mm. three, four different good quality sources all basically saying the same thing. Mm. Then you can feel relatively confident when you use that evidence in your work. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, I have got a question from R. Joe. Any tips for writing essays when you're struggling to get to grips with the subject matter? Ah, okay. Uh, tips, uh, so when you're struggling to get... I think you... I wouldn't start the writing yeah. um, before I was getting more to grips. Now, getting to grips with the subject matter um, sometimes can be... One thing I tend to find quite useful uh, as a, my prior experience with the t as a teacher is, is one of the best ways of learning something is having to teach it, mm. having to explain it to somebody else, and that if uh, you're struggling to understand what you're reading, uh, one of the things which you can do is try and uh, explain what you do understand to somebody else. Mm. And the act of explaining it to somebody else, having to explain it to somebody else so it makes sense, can sometimes just unlock a few doors, it can, mm. it can just get a few cogs moving and you go back to the text and you read it again and you're like, oh, okay, now it makes a bit more sense. Mm. Um, one of the other things though would be, you know, if you only understand 70%, that's, that, you know, that's still 70% of the text that you're understanding. Mm. Um, so I think it's also useful to go back to the learning materials on the module yeah. site to read through those mm. really, really carefully. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. if there's something you don't understand, for students to get in touch with their module coordinator yes. because that's what they're there for, yeah. is to help you with the subject matter. Another thing that I would always suggest to students is go back to the real basic reading. Mm -hmm. So go to those real textbooks, you know, the Dictionary of Criminology, the real basic books that you start off with. Have a read through those. So if you're reading things that are quite complex, take it back a few levels as well. But to, but to get in touch with us would be the critical one. I think one of the other things, this may be straight slightly off the writing of the better essays, this is maybe a bit earlier on, but the notes that you write, if you are reading quite passively, and I would define passively as being when you just reading doing nothing or even reading with a, a highlighter mm. or reading on the computer and finding in interesting points and copying and pasting those into a notes document that's exceptionally passive you're mm. not actually doing very much processing the information the more active you can be the more likely you are going to be to understand yeah i think and you're so absolutely right if there. you can write yeah. down what you're s what you're yeah. reading and what you're understanding and what you're not understanding mm. have a conversation with yourself written down about mm how you're not understanding, what you think it might mean, um, and sometimes puzzling it out. A little mm. bit of that sort of slightly targeted free writing, which I appreciate does sound a bit contradictory, but 
that can be really, really helpful. Mm. Uh, that's got me out of a few... Yeah, no, I think that's books. really good. Active reading rather yeah. than passive reading. Yeah. And also reading a couple of times as well, I think, sometimes yeah. helps. If you don't understand something the first time, go back, read it again, read it out loud, yes. read it really slowly. Brilliant. Thank you, Gordon. Number two, a clear introduction and essay structure. I'm managing to squeeze two into each of these <laughs> points. Okay, so uh, clear introduction and essay structure. Which one would you say comes first in your writing process? Which one has to come first? In your I always process? write this okay. at the end yeah. because I don't know what's coming later. Yeah. How do you? How can you introduce something which you don't have yet? Yeah. yeah. And what I what I find frustrating in students' work sometimes is that I read the introduction and think, oh great, they're going to talk about A, B, and C, <laughs> yeah, and, they and they don't. Yeah. They don't talk about A. I mean, I understand where it comes from. It, it you know it comes from us all being at school and writing by hand and yes. by necessity you had to write the yeah. introduction first because that was it going to be mm. at the top of the page but now we've got computers yeah i mean i didn't uh, i'm going back to my master's uh, dissertation i didn't write that till about four days before it was due in mm. there was no point um the introduction basically has to have two main points one is that you identify the broad issue that you're going to be discussing in more detail um for the reader got to bear in mind that you know Markers like you have got X number of scripts, and certainly where you've got questions where choose A, B, and C, and use A, B, or use one of those to describe one of these crimes, for mm. example, that means you've got potentially 12, 24 sort of combinations mm. of essays that you might be reading. You've got to know when you get started what you're about yes. to read yeah. as, a, as a marker. And I think a lot of students don't necessarily remember that. You know, it's kind of keeping the audience in mind. So first of all, the essay structure, sorry, the, first of all, the introduction has to have an overview of what's about to be covered. Yes. Very broad sort of view, not talking in lots of detail, you're not talking about lots of citations here. Um, and then the second part is the train announcement. It's the, it, it's the overview of the structure. It's we're going to be going here, we're going to be stopping here, 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 and here. Mm. So the reader has a very clear idea. And as you said, those need to then match up because you've mm. read essays where the, st the student's done a fantastic job of writing an mm. introduction. Uh, going to do this, going to do this, going to do this. And then they don't. Yes. And that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So clear introductions are absolutely vital. I also quite like in the introduction a just a bit of a gentle reminder of what the topic's about. Yes. And, and why it's important. I was just talking to John about miscarriage mm. of justice and investigations. Yeah. You know, in that case, if you were writing something about changing investigations within mm. policing, you might just start with, there has been a controversial history of miscarriage yeah. of justice in the UK, yeah. which has led to the need for better policing investigations. Making this essay... Some sort of report that yeah, highlighted this absolutely. recently. Yeah, oh, that sort of I thing. really like that, because yeah. it shows an awareness that students know what's going on. Yeah. But yeah. The, and then you go on to, like you say, the train announcement, this essay yeah. will, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then, I think as a reader, I feel nicely relaxed then. I think, right, settle down, I can enjoy this, I yeah. know what the topic is, and I know what's going to be covered. Yeah. Off we go, yeah. and you feel nicely relaxed. Absolutely. We're, we're running out of time already, Gordon. This is amazing. Um, this one. Now, as I've already said, we met, chatted with Linda earlier, mm. so we talked a little bit about this, but referencing fully within the essay. Yeah, uh, referencing within the essay, uh, you've got to remember that the citations that you are using apply only to the sentence that they are in. Mm. Uh, they do not, you can't put a citation at the end of the paragraph and make it apply to the entire paragraph. Uh, just the conventions that we use in, terms of, uh, in academic writing are that citation is specific to the sentence it's yeah. in. And just keep putting them in. It doesn't matter yeah. if there are lots of references in a paragraph. Yeah. If you're using a point from the evidence that yeah. you've gathered that you haven't come up with yourself, stick a reference at the end yeah. of the I sentence. Mean, you, might, you might get... Um, yeah, the, the potential damage of over-referencing is so, so, so much less than the potential damage of under-referencing. Mm, absolutely. Um, under-referencing can fail assign it has failed it does fail assignments mm. um so yeah i think that's 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 a key thing um you just got to bear in mind any sort of information that you got from somewhere else mm. you just need to acknowledge where you got the information from yeah. you did a bunch of work reading mm. uh when you were putting an essay together so you know give yourself acknowledge that yeah yeah right we've got a couple of minutes left yeah. for two to move on quickly Move from description to discussion. Okay, what's the difference between description and discussion, discussion then? Description uh, would be the facts, it would be the figures, it would be the information that you get from 
uh, other sources. It's all the evidence that you're bringing in to uh, build your argument. The discussion is then your argument. Mm. And a lot of students feel very uncomfortable because there's this whole, I'm not allowed to give my opinion. Mm. And that, I, I don't know, but I have huge issues with that because we do need to see their opinion. We need to see an informed opinion. Informed opinion, yeah. Um, and if we don't see an informed opinion, there's no critical analysis. It's basically a glorified Wikipedia page. And, we'll, you know, it's not academic. Mm. But I think there's a fear of this sometimes, isn't oh, there? Enormous. That enormous. people will think that they're not referencing properly. Yeah. Whereas if you've done the description, which is mm. what does the literature tell us? Mm -hmm. What does the statistics tell us? The discussion is then... Why does that matter? Yeah. What's important about that? Yeah. And you can, as a student, you can discuss what's important about it because you're basing that discussion on the evidence. As are long you, as you base all of that on the evidence, you're fine. One of the things that I would say is, is very, very quickly, we are running out of time, is that with the sentences that have descriptions, those tend to be the sentences that are going to have citations in them. Mm. When you've just written a sentence that has a citation that's drawn a point from a source, make yourself write in the next, uh, make yourself write in the next sentence um, an answer to the question, so what? Yes, um, definitely. You know, so why does I that just, matter? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why does that matter? Why do... Um, why and also, why are you telling me that? Yes. You know, and that relates to our last point, which is about signposting. Yeah. Because you might produce some really good evidence in yeah. your essay as a student, but you need to tell your marker why you're producing yeah. that evidence and why it's important, and that relates to signposting, doesn't it, it? It does, absolutely. I mean, signposting, I know a lot of students feel uncomfortable with it because they feel it's condescending. Mm. Um, they feel it, it's a little bit too going back to school. Mm. It's uh, this essay will first discuss this. And yes, I mean, that can be oversimplistic, mm. but if that's where you're at at the moment with your signposting skills, use it. Yes. Um, you will develop subtler, more nuanced ways of doing yeah. signposting as you go along. But if you just avoid it completely, you're never going to make progress. Yeah. In terms of I think that's a really better. important point that you've made there, that it doesn't matter if it's basic at the start, yeah. but just do it because you will get better at it. And it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier with the mm. introduction. It relaxes your reader yeah. because it tells them where we're going and it tells yeah. them where you've been. Yeah. And it's the train announcement thing again, Absolutely, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's mechanical, it is a bit structural, it, it's, you know, you're not writing poetry, you're not writing, uh, the, you know, the next sort of bestseller Booker Prize uh, piece here. Um, so, yeah, it, it You've got to, you do have to kind of make your peace with the fact that signposting, it's not the most exciting um, sentence that you'll write that day, yeah. but it is exceptionally necessary. Mm. And it tells people why what you've written is important yeah. and what's coming up next as well. And yeah, it? so just signposting, beginning, topic sentence, you're going to say what you're go what's going to be in that paragraph, the end of that paragraph, the end of that point, link it back to the question. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was really useful, as yeah, I ever. I think we've just about everything. Just about everything. Yeah. We might make a new board for next time. We might yeah. splash out a little bit, but thank you very yeah. much, as always. Now, we're back with Alexandra, who, in these two very short videos, is considering fiddly formatting in your CV and, importantly, how to access the help of the Careers and Employability Service. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about some of the fiddly aspects of formatting, some things that you are worth remembering to make things work. When it comes to laying out a CV document and deciding how to structure it, many people really find this a challenge and quite frustrating. And I think one of the reasons behind this is that there are so many different options with CVs. There simply isn't a single right or wrong way to do it, and what works best for you wouldn't necessarily suit the next person at all. So whatever examples you look at or suggestions you find, they're likely to have both pros and cons, especially when you take your own personal circumstances into account. Having said that, there are some simple rules, or correction, maybe I should say they are firm guidelines, because some rules really are made to be broken when it's justified. You may well not fit the mould and you shouldn't have to try. Anyway, there are a few tips that are likely to suit most of us on most occasions for UK applications. Begin with your contact details at the head of the page and there is no need for curriculum vitae to take up space at the top. If you're posting the CV online rather than sending it directly, do consider security and some would say you don't need to give your street address. Think about how much information you're giving away. Always aim to finish with two full balanced pages of text to give a professional, well-organised impression 
This is massively better than one and a half pages, which can just look like you've run out of steam and got nothing much to say. Always choose a clear, easy to read font that's available for all operating systems. So something like Arial, Verdana, Calibri, Times New Roman. The first few of those are all sans serif fonts, which make for spacious, easy reading on the page. And Times New Roman is a more traditional font that can really help to give a formal impression. Whichever you choose, you're probably gonna to need to use size 10 or 12 to keep it clear and easy to read. And my final rule is to make sure that you use consistent headings and subheadings to separate the different elements of your document. It doesn't particularly matter which style you choose as long as you organise each heading level the same way every time. So each new section should have the same formatting. My CV, for example, all the headings are in bold capitals and the subheadings within each section in my CV are just bold but lowercase regular text. And watch out for your font size and spacing too, as these are often areas where I see inconsistencies that look messy and careless and could jeopardise your chances. Another formatting related decision is, is how you choose to write, paragraphs or bullet points. Again, there's no single right way of doing it. I mostly choose to use bullet points because it tends to make it easier to be concise when you're writing, but it doesn't really matter which you choose as long as you apply it consistently. And always think about how the default formatting on your software or any template affects your available space. Bullet points are usually automatically indented. Do you want that or need it? If you don't, remember you can select the whole list and pull the margin back in line with the ruler at the top of the screen. It's all under your control, so don't let the computer take charge. In this clip, I want to just remind you all that distance learning students are entitled to the same level of support as all our other students, even if you may prefer to access it in a slightly different way. For example, many campus-based students who want to update their CV drop into our centre every day, no appointment needed. And we realise that this is less likely to be an option for distance learners, so it may well suit you better to book a time to speak to an advisor about your plans and how best to present yourself. The best way to do this is to call our front of house staff on 02392 842684 so they can see all the available appointments and find one that's convenient for you. We can run your appointment over the phone or video chat using Google Hangouts and that's part of your university Gmail package and we'll call you so you don't have to worry about the price of international calls if you're overseas. We also have information and advice about CVs available all the time through our website where you'll find plenty of other useful stuff as well. And if you can't find what you're looking for, please do email or call us and we'll try to point you in the right direction. CVs are an interesting one because they're personalised. And ideally, this means they're both specific to you as an individual, making the best of all your skills and achievements and tailored to the employer you're targeting. Or of course, if it's further study you're thinking of, tailored to the course. And while this can make for a time-consuming process in writing the CV, it also means that you can focus on exactly what's best for the opportunity at hand. Great news, you can make it say exactly what you want. Yes, the flip side of that is that you'll need to adapt it to suit each specific opportunity. However, you're, if you're applying for several jobs in the same or a similar field, you'll certainly be able to recycle the majority of your content. You don't need to rewrite the whole document from scratch each time. And I hope that's a reassuring way to start thinking about the latest upgrade that you can make to your CV. Welcome back. I hope you found some of those tips from Alexandra useful. The Careers and Employability Service are a great part of the university and really should be used as much as possible. So do have a look at their website and see all of the other services that they can provide for you. I'm joined on the sofa now by Mark Jacobs. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Sarah. Hello. Uh, Mark, as you may know, is the course leader of the Crime and Criminology degree. So we're talking criminology this morning, and in particular, we're going to be focusing on the sociology of deviance and also cultural criminology as well. So perhaps before we start on that, a broad question, what is the sociology of deviance? Uh, with the sociology of deviance, it is broadly trying to stand back and look at deviance from a, a more holistic approach, uh, and both also trying to understand the deviant as a, a human being, rather than previously, at a bit of the, when, the, when these ideas emerged, what was dominant was a positivistic approach, and they tended to sort of just focus more entirely on the individual, 
uh, but just assume their behavior was kind of wrong and uh, as a result of some sort of illness or defect. Mm. Whereas a social deviance sort of sees things, sees, sees things much more fluid, mm. sees a uh, deviance actually is, is actually maybe a, a part of normal life. And what they tend to do is try and explain it in a, in a as David Matson says, a much more appreciative approach, mm. where it's not condemning deviance or criminality and arguing that it's, it's wrong and it should be something that should be erased but actually seeing deviance as an example of actually human difference and diversity. Mm. Uh, and linked in, that, it linked in with that is a very different kind of research methodology and a very different set of research values. Mm. So the sociological understanding of deviance is one which is more broader, encompassing and un a focus on the individual, but understanding the individual within their social context yeah. and understanding the life world of the individual. I think you used a really important word there when you were talking about what used to happen in mainstream uh, criminology where you said there is the people assume yeah. and I think that that's one of the interesting things about the sociology of deviance isn't it is that those assumptions are cast aside about that people will have particular pathologies and it will be the strains and stresses of particular life it casts all those aside mm. and takes a fresh look a different look at yeah. why people might commit crime yeah and it also makes us start thinking about ourselves I mean I just marked an essay listening to you and uh, Gordon a moment ago and I was doing marking before I came in and our students talking about antisocial behaviour as if it's something that should be, can be erased and eradicated. And I wrote on the, the, the script, I said, have you never been involved in antisocial behaviour? Mm. Have you never been involved in behaviour that might be regarded as deviant? It, does that make you, and the essay was kind of about flawed organisms, does that make you a flawed organism that is required to be cured and corrected? Or, or are we all involved in deviance? And actually deviance, therefore, is about relativity of behaviour and not assuming that some forms of behaviour are absolutely wrong. Yes. But one form of behaviour engaged in by a student or a, a priest or an employee is, is just relative to any other yeah. member of society. So we're moving away from the non-criminals and the criminals as two very distinct groups, aren't we? Absolutely. So when did this sociology of deviance emerge? Well, I just want to make another thing clear, because when you talk about the sociolog sociological approaches, there's two type of different ways of thinking. There was early sociological criminology, and that was very much bound up with the Chicago School. Mm. And it's a quite a com complex school, but the Chicago sociology did suggest that you can kind of change social order to bring about so getting rid of social problems and making mm. things function uh, without deviance. So there's an aspect of, of sociological functionalism here, to assume that we can create a perfect social order mm. to eradicate uh, deviance. Uh, what we are talking about today is talking about a, a broader sociological understanding which is less about trying to s suggest we can derive a perfectly functioning society and instead so saying that society, is, as I say, is diverse, plural, relative. And it emerged in, the, in around about the late 1960s mm. and very much on the back of new deviancy theories and by new deviancy theories I'm talking about the work of subcultural theorists and labelling theorists. Mm. Now what they did collectively was begin to sort of asked questions about what is social order, whose social order are we trying to sort of assume, and who's reacting to different forms of behaviour. Mm. So it emerged in the late 1960s, 1970s, particularly in America, labelling theorists are uh, typically sort of North American as were subcultural theorists, uh, and, and in Britain these ideas became popular amongst young sociologists, uh, and there's a number of key people that then went on to become the doyens of British criminology. Mm. Uh, these people, people like Stan Cohen, Jock Young, uh, Paul Walton, and, and others, they became kind of uh, the kind of the doyens of, of new emerging criminology. Indeed, mm. they wrote a book called The New Criminology. Uh, and the point of the book is to say that we're creating a new criminology, a new way of thinking, which attacks and dislodges the dominance of positivism. Mm. So they created a new criminology, uh, uh, and that was actually in part a critique of the social yeah. of deviance as well. But it, it was far more about trying to be understand and appreciate the deviant without condemning them as something who to be wrong and also they themselves these, many of these young sociologists were themselves deviant yes you know they're involved in all sorts of music <laughs> cultures drug cultures mm. out, you know using alcohol they were very non-conformist mm. I think what I particularly like about the sociology of deviance which hadn't really been looked at before was that it didn't take crime as the starting point it wanted to look before that happened, in terms of well, who decided this was a crime? Mm. Who you know, who's in charge of the the legal structure of, of devising laws? And I think that approach is quite interesting. That it doesn't go from crime onwards; it actually looks backwards as well. It, it does do that. It it does do it to some extent. It does do it. To some, what the sociologists of deviance did there, they did look at kind of the low level agents of control. Mm. They did look at police. They did look at welfare practitioners. They looked at educationalists, social workers. So they did look at the low level agents of control. But they didn't 
do a deeper analysis mm. of power. So although their work, the social of deviance in the 1960s and 1970s, was very important, they were very limited because mm. they, they got themselves involved with what some people refer to as a kind of a moral voyeurism. Mm. In other words, they said, wow, look over there, there's people smoking marijuana. Wow, look over there, there's people involved in living in the commune. Wow, look over there, there's people involved in, I don't know, creating poetry and music. And it was almost like creating a sense of, well, a goldness as zookeepers of, of deviance. Mm. It's kind of almost celebrating the, the fact that s social norms are diverse and people live very different lifestyles. Mm. Uh, but your, your point there is actually what they didn't really go is, is kind of connect mm. these very different disparate groups with the, the kind of the controlling agencies. Yeah. So did criminology become more political? A Absolutely. Little? Yeah. This, the, the, the early social movements kind of began to question things like, well, what, as you argue, you know, what, what is outlawed? What is criminal? Mm. Uh, and began to see things as, as far more complicated. Mm. And, and began raising those questions about who are the controllers and, and in whose interests are these laws and ideas. I'm interested you say that uh, a lot of these sociologists were looking at different types of behaviour. What research methods were they using in order to do that? Good question, sir. It's a really good question because it's an issue that students also need to think about in their own research methods modules. Mm. Uh, but rather than doing top-down research where they're assuming that crime is wrong and you need to try and discover what the causes of what the what caused a person to be crime and how you might be able to cure or control that crime. And this research methods of the social deviance tended to be far more bottom up. Mm. And what it involved is instead of doing top down research, it involved a considerable amount of what's called ethnographies or participant observations. Indeed, for some of these sociologists, it was almost like a, a, some form of self ethnography or self participant observation because they themselves were part of, kind of the counter cultural backdrop. Mm. So, what these research methods involved is, is is participating in the life worlds of the deviants that they want to better understand. Uh, you know, recording the events, speaking to the individuals, allowing the deviants to give their own testimony or explanation as to why they behave the way they do, and how these individuals themselves also feel the kind of the, the pressure of reaction and social reaction. Hmm. So the research methods are very bottom up. Is about allowing the subjective realities. What positivism is very much concerned with is objective. Mm. You know, just because one person's experience isn't replicated by another, doesn't mean it's not valid or not authentic. So you, a lot of the best work in in, in criminology is done by social deviants because you get very very detailed accounts of people's lives. Yeah. I mean, ethnography literally means the description of cultures, yeah. which is, and that's what it's all about, which is still flourishing today. We've got uh, the University of Portsmouth are hosting the Ethnography Symposium in August of this year. So these research methods are still very valid today. Yeah. Now, we need to, we've got so much we want to talk about, but we need to move on to, to look at cultural criminology as well. But before we do that, does the sociology of deviance still exist? It does still exist, but it exists as a far more kind of nuanced uh, approach is a thing about criminology is, is sometimes things get like old wine and new, bo new bottles mm. uh, and it just kind of gets repackaged and rebranded and to some extent cultural criminology is a little like that. Okay, tell it, us more about cultural criminology. Cultural criminology again as with the social deviance that emerged in the 1970s particularly associated with the National Deviancy Conference mm. uh, it was a, in part a reaction to the, the mundane boring positivistic criminology mm. Uh, and indeed, cultural criminology equally emerged in the late, late 1990s. And it too emerged in response to what people regard as kind of the, the banality, the mundane uh, mainstream uh, criminologies. Mm. Again, very much a reaction to administrative criminology, very much a reaction to kind of the controlling kind of criminologies, that, you know, classicism and positivism, rational choice theories. Mm. Uh, so c cultural criminology emerged again as a reaction to the dissatisfaction with mainstream criminology. Mm. Uh, and very much what they said, and they said a number of things, they said what many mainstream criminologies don't do is again, as social deviants again, is really try and understand the experience of the deviant. Mm. And in, in one respect, what their cultural criminologists do try and say is talk about actually very many people don't commit crime necessarily because of poverty, because of illness, because of uh, other reasons. A lot of people commit, I changed the word crime, deviant, mm. because it's fun. Mm. Uh, a lot of criminality is about thrill-seeking mm -hmm. or actually escaping being controlled. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just always reflect upon when I've been on London Underground, how it kind of controls and filters people through different routes in and out of the underground network. Uh, and that's what our life is very much. We're very controlled. You know, are we insured? Are we walking on the pavement properly? Are mm -hmm. we following the traffic lights? Everything. And what cultural criminality is, actually a lot of criminality is born out of this attempt to try and 
break out of control, mm. uh, seize a moment of autonomy. Uh, a lot of the cultural technologies have done work around what they call edge work. Mm. Uh, edge work is what they call illicit voluntary risk taking. And what I mean here is why do people do uh, bungee jumping? Why do people do uh, base jumping where you jump off of high buildings? And I argue a lot of people do this because it's a moment where it might be madness, but actually they're, they're seizing control. Yeah. That, that moment of, of dropping from a high skyscraper is, although it might seem something like ridiculous, they're actually controlling all the elements as best they can. Mm. And there's a sense of feeling alive. And people who are most susceptible to that thrill-seeking are young people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see it in the streets. You can see like parkour, free running, mm. skateboarding, you know, anything that's kind of risk-taking, tombstoning. And it's mm. a problem down in uh, Devon where people are jumping off kind of uh, cliff faces. Mm. Uh, and the authorities try and control it. In, in Portsmouth, we've got uh, uh, the old hot walls, like a barricade. And, and you know, young people are like, jumping off the walls into the, the water. Mm. And there's all sorts of warnings about the danger that you might land on hidden things submerged in the water. But the more you try and control mm. what edge work does, the more people try and overcome those controls. So cultural criminology is interested in the control aspect as well as the other aspect of people thrill-seeking. Yes, yes. It's very, and again, it's a, it's a, it's a say that everything is, is relative. That people are trying to see sees the amount of, of autonomy and creativity. Mm. And there are echoes there what the sociologists of deviance did in the 1970s. Mm. Again, it was about trying to appreciate mm. why people involved the bait, have the, the, themselves and the behaviour they do, and also appreciate how people react to the controlling systems around us. Yeah. We've got time for one more question, Mark, which okay. I think hopefully will we'll bridge the gap of the two. Okay. Is, the, is the role of the media in all of this and the, the influence of the media within both sociology of deviance and cultural criminology? Absolutely. Again, the sociology of deviance in <laughs> the 1970s, the key work produced by Jock Young called The Drug Takers, and, and another one we're most familiar with is Stan Cohen's Folk Devils and Moral Panics. Mm. And the complicated books, seminal books, but in part what they're arguing is about, you know, you take the position of one person and another and you get completely different realities, social realities. Mm. Uh, and it led to this idea of moral panics and the argument actually, well, is again a selectivity of what you're going to actually identify. I always think about the moral panic theory is like if you're going to buy a new car, suddenly you see that new car everywhere on the road. It's like you didn't realise there were so many of them all of a sudden. And that's what moral panic is a little bit like, is that it's a selectivity of a particular form of deviant behaviour. Suddenly the public become increasingly aware of it, alert mm. to it, and it becomes a big social problem. Mm. But a key thing we've got to understand with cultural criminologists is the media is very different today as it was in the 1960s, 1970s. Yeah. Media in the 1960s, you might be limited to radio broadcasts. Now what cultural criminology is, we're saturated with media. Mm. It's not just 24-hour rolling news, it's social media. So cultural criminology also want to understand, well, how do you create, is moral panic any relevant in today's context where you've got so many media outlets? Mm. So many media outlets. I suppose the importance is who's controlling that media as well. Again, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and again, they're saying it's very much fragmented and diverse, and they're saying there's emergence between fact and fiction. Mm. So there are some similarities between the two, which I think are quite, are quite interesting. Mark, thank you so much. Sorry we didn't have more time to chat. The time this morning is absolutely whizzing by. But there were some really interesting points there, I think, about the two types and the development of criminology, which mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. is really important. And just very briefly, you know, students often think that theories came along one by one, but they all merge into each yeah. other, don't they? And there's a, you know, there's a pattern that's forming. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mark. Mm -hmm. Now, we have another short video for you now, which also relates to our What is Important in series of short lectures. This time, Professor Francis Parkes is discussing what is important in the world of prisons. We're now going to talk about prisons for eight minutes. I, I say often to my PhD students, can you do an elevator pitch? Can you tell me in 30 seconds or a minute what's good about your stuff? So I've got eight. So this is a really slow elevator, <laughs> or a really long one. Um, people, in this country, how many people are in prison? What's the number, roughly? Anyone, give us a shout. 80,000. I hear... 85,000, 80,000, there you go, between you, you're, you're pretty much there, it's about 82, 83, and it's a number, and it's difficult to make sense of, of, of what that number actually means, it's a lot more than in previous generations, um, it's a lot more than many other countries, it's a lot less than some other countries. Um, I live in Fareham, population about 42,000, so there's two people in prison for every person in Fareham. Or the population of Western Supermare, if you, if you care. Worldwide people. How many people are in prison in the world? 
Anyone dare to give a, give a shout? I have a million. Who says higher? Who says lower? I have six and a half million. Who says, okay, people, we have six and a half million. That's a good marker. Who says more than six and a half? Who says less? I sorry, I'm Bruce, don't I? Who, who says less than six and a half? It's about ten and a half. Ten, there you go. Prizes here, people. Uh, ten and a half million. We don't know precisely because not every country is very open with its policies and practice of incarcerating people. They aren't always in prison, but they can be in institutions that are obliquely termed and well out of the way. So we don't know precisely how many, but our running figure is in the order of 10 and a half million. That's maybe the population of Sweden thereabouts, Czech Republic. It's, it's, it's a medium-sized country's worth of people locked up. What's important in prisons? I just thought, OK, four, four keywords, safety, dignity, imagination, hope. Safety is important. You read the newspapers, you've seen an increase in prison rioting very recently. Birmingham prison, Bedford prison, Autumn Grange, there are there, several others. Um, you may have seen that the number of prison officers has been reduced by several thousand since 2010. It's slightly on the up now, but there has been a big reduction in their number in the, in the last number of years. Uh, Self-harm is up, suicides um, are up, and overall prisoners and prison officers feel less safe than they did maybe a decade ago. Safety is a precondition for better things, and it's a moral right. These people are held by the state and therefore deserve care by the state. It's a moral right to feel safe in a state-owned or state-run institution. Next, dignity. Dignity is a fuzzy term sometimes. What is dignity? Well, it's having a degree of privacy. It's having access to bathrooms, showers, having half-decent food having a sense that at one level, you're cared about, you're cared for. There are wonderful people working in our prison system. Some are volunteers. Many people work in what we call the belly of the beast, the prison system, with passion, with optimism, and they do wonderful things. But altogether, I do believe that the system falls short on dignity, despite the wonderful efforts of many, many people in it. Dignity is also a moral right, but it's also, again, a precondition. If you want good things to happen in prison, you need a basis of safety and dignity. So how can good things happen in prison? Well, we need some imagination. Prison is forever torn between locking people up and making it hurt, and making people better. It's very difficult to do that in the same breath. To make sure it's painful, and to ensure that people come out thinking, you know what, I'm going to do good in this life. That's a very tall order. We need imagination as to how to strike a balance between punishment, what it is and what it should be, and an opportunity for individuals to improve and have a better shout at life. So where does imagination come from? Well, have a look abroad. This is something my colleagues already get sick about, people. I've been to Iceland to do prison research. And um, I was asked to, treat, to be treated like, like a prisoner. So they gave me a room, and I did the daily routine, and I ate the food, and I uh, did everything uh, that prisoners are supposed to do. Um, and well, that's an interesting experience. And I interviewed anyone who wanted to talk to me at, at, at the same time. One of the things in prisons in Iceland, people, is there's coffee on tap. You can just walk to the kitchen and go, and you've got coffee. Coffee is strong. It's rocket fuel. But it's there for you all the time. People think nothing of it. So in the daytime, all being equal, what you always can do is trundle over to the coffee machine. The food's great, cooked by prisoners. Even in high secure, which I wasn't at, but also in, in open prisons, food is cooked by prisoners, which means shopping, thinking about ingredients, cooking for your fellow prisoners. And there very much is a culture that if you don't say thank you, mate, well done, love the, love the casserole this, this, this lunchtime, you are 
in a way falling short of what safety and dignity and good relationships are in those prisons. And prisons are perfectly capable of doing that, of cooking good stuff. The food is great. Not just okay, not just adequate. It was really nice. Um, when you have safety and dignity, good things can happen if the conditions are such that uh, you bring, you bring uh, uh, good relationships about and you allow for certain, certain simple human qualities to flourish. So imagination, look elsewhere. I'm not saying that some of the things that happen in the Nordic countries don't happen here, such as caring for animals, uh, having your own key to your own, to your own room, uh, internet in your room, which I had, restricted, no social media, I couldn't even Twitter, so when you talk about deprivation, that's the extent to which I felt it. Um, but internet in room is a genuine possibility, without it freaking out the newspapers, the population, or anybody else. At some point, these people come back. And the phrase I was often told by prison officers is, they will be your neighbors again. They will be our neighbors again. So it's important that they have every fighting chance of getting better. The last one is a word I hesitantly use, but I hope you know what I mean. Hope. Hope for prisoners to think the situation I find myself in today, it can be better tomorrow, or the day after, or next week, or next year. That means that a clear pathway of progression through the prison system is important. From the first prison to maybe closed conditions, to maybe cat B, cat C, to open prisons. The idea that if all goes okay, my conditions, my lot will be better in the near future. So hope within the system. It needs to be structurally available and it needs to be culturally available. It helps with managing prisons. If prisoners believe that if things go well, things get better. It makes prisons damn sight better to manage. And it offers the possibility of things working out in the end. So you need hope within the system, culturally and structurally. And you need hope for beyond, beyond the gate. Um, I visited a large uh, women's prison in this country, and I was struck by the anxiety that existed around release. Rather than looking forward to release, there were many women who worry about release. Who is there waiting for them at the gate? Often the last person you wish that, that would be waiting for them at the gate. So quite often there is a prospect of homelessness, of the wrong crowd, of financial hardship, of having to mend thoroughly broken relationships. Release can be an anxiety-ridden prospect for many prisoners. We need to do so much better there too. The psychological imprisonment doesn't end at the gate. And we need to do much, much more to provide prospects for those who leave a life of crime behind step into our society again and find it really difficult to find their feet. So we need hope inside, and perhaps even more importantly, we need hope on the outside. That's what I think is important. Welcome back. We're joined for the final session of this virtual study day by Dr. Nathan Hall. Good morning, Nathan. Good morning. And we're talking about my second favourite <coughs> subject. Sorry, I said to Gordon earlier that my favourite subject was talking about was writing better essays. But one of my second favourite <laughs> topics to talk about is dissertations. Yep. I think the whole process around dissertations, it's actually great fun. And I know that students get a bit nervous about the whole thing. But it's, I think it's a really exciting time for students when they get to their dissertation stage. So I'm going to stop rabbiting on anyway yep. about dissertations, and I'm now going to pass over to you because you're going to be asking me the questions. I am. I thought I'd, uh, I'd rattle through a few of the questions that we get asked most often um, yes. as, um, as supervisors. And interesting use of the word fun. Um, there. Sorry. Right. I think what you mean by that is <laughs> that obviously the, the, this is one of the first occasions where the students effectively get set their own question yes. and, and they masters their own destiny Absolutely. Um, in that regard. But it, that brings with it some extra, um, extra challenges. So quite often students will say early on, yeah. I've got an idea. Yeah. And then they don't know what they do with that. Yeah. So how do you get from this notion of I've got an idea about something that I want to do yeah. and turn it into a research question? Okay, that's, that's more difficult than it sounds actually because it's mm. a quick question but it's a, it's a long process because often when students come to us with an idea it's this big, the idea, isn't it? It is. And, and it often students think it has to be this because big. Because it's a really yeah. big piece of work yeah. and what they decide is that they're going to look at the process of an offender going through the criminal justice system 
from policing through to pre-trial, prosecution, <laughs> court, prison, probation, and then life after release. And then think, well, there's my idea. And then how do I narrow it down? Because it's really important that students try to narrow down their ideas at those early stages. Because although 10,000 words might seem a lot, I don't know about you, but I've never come across a student who struggles to get to 10,000 words. It's the, always, always the opposite. It's yes. the struggle to get it down to 10,000 yes. words that's the problem. And it always takes people by surprise. Yes. Always. It's the, I've written 20, <laughs> yes. now what do I do? Yeah. You know, take out the last three <laughs> chapters or something. So you've got this idea, and then the best way, I always think, to find out more about it and to work out exactly what you want your focus to be is just to read. Read, 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 and research. And find out as much as you can about the topic area, because mm. then as a student, you'll begin to find out what are the important issues, what's been covered before, what are the important issues, what are the emerging issues, where would I like my much more narrow focus to be? So that's around reading and research. And our students will be doing that for their research methods course that they yes. do at level five. So hopefully, by the time they start their dissertation, they will have narrowed it down uh, a little bit more as well. So it's about doing that review of the literature, that broad review of the literature, and working out exactly what they want to study. And turning that into a question is quite mm. often something that's really helpful to do, isn't it? If you've got an idea about a particular part of, um, uh, of criminology or security or fraud or, or whatever, um, that can obviously be quite vague. Um, mm. But actually asking yourself a question that you want to try and answer yeah. is often quite a sensible way of, of, of at least starting the, the framing process. Yeah, and not keeping it one-dimensional. So not everything that I know about serial killers or everything that I know <laughs> about electronic tagging, but perhaps make it a little bit, bit more nuanced, add in an extra dimension to it. So perhaps it's looking at the electronic monitoring of offenders for first-time offenders or for female offenders or something like that, rather than everything I know about dot, dot, dot. And of course, the more time you spend reading the literature in advance of this, the, the more chance you have of finding little gaps in the yeah. literature that maybe you want to try and fill, um, rather than just ending up regurgitating things that other, other people have said. It's about yeah. that new angle, if you can find it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And we're not trying, we're not expecting you know, great original work from no, our undergraduate no. students no. at all, but there will always be a question that focuses on something slightly different from something that someone else is focused on, particularly mm. if you're looking at current materials. And it's quite uh, quite useful for distance learning students, almost as an advantage over um, campus-based students here, because if you're working in the field, mm. you'll probably know um, some areas that, that, that we don't know much about or could do with some extra extra research. Mm, so it's about absolutely. making most of the opportunities, I suppose, of, of, of your work environment and, mm. and, and, and what you do on a daily basis. Yeah. Okay, so we've got that then, we've got idea, we're yep. thinking about a question. Yep. Um, the next question, I suppose, is what does a dissertation look like? There are different types, aren't there? Yes, and on the dissertation module site, um, there is a link to e-dissertations that students can look at, so they can see what a dissertation looks like. So I think that's often maybe similar for you. It's often a question I get, what is a dissertation? Mm. Other than it being a very long piece of work, what do they look like? Often students don't know that they're split into different chapters, for example. Um, but there are different types of dissertations that students can do, uh, and they involve different levels of research, some doing primary research, some not doing primary research. Shall I talk about I talk about those? If you would like to. Okay. So <laughs> there are different types of dissertations that students can do. They can, if they want to, go into an organisation or do some other form of primary research uh, where they are asking questions, finding out something that maybe has not been found out before. So students, if they work in the policing environment, for example, may want to do a survey of police officers. Uh, they may want to go and talk to members of the public about something. If they want to do primary research, though, what am I going to say next? You're going to say... Ethics. Ethics. It's really, really <laughs> important that students, well, it is absolutely vital, not really important, it is more than that, it's absolutely vital that students get ethical approval for any primary research that they want to do before any data is collected. Otherwise, that won't be marked. It won't be marked. No. It simply won't be marked. Yeah. So even though you've got the agreement of your boss to go and submit a survey around to all of your colleagues, that's not enough. It has to go through the full ethical approval of the University Ethics Committee. And whilst that sounds quite a, a, a challenging thing to do, and, and actually in some regards it is, it's actually a really useful process mm. because if you have a look at the, um, the ethics site and the forms that you'll have to fill out, quite a lot of it talks about things that you're going to have to be doing anyway. Mm. So your aims and your objectives and, and um, a, a little bit of a, a, an outline of what the subject is about and, and actually a, a good 
um, ethics form actually works really well as a template for a methodology chapter. Absolutely. You have to think about yeah. all of these things. And you have to think about things that you maybe wouldn't have thought about. I mean, I've just very recently filled in one myself, and there were areas that I hadn't really considered, but when forced to fill in all of the boxes, you have to consider it in more detail. So it's a, it's a longish process, <laughs> slightly painful, I might add, but really, really useful. So yeah. if any primary <laughs> research that you want to do uh, must have full ethical approval. There's secondary uh, research as well that students can choose for their dissertation, so they can get some data that's already out there, whether it's newspaper reports, whether it's crime statistics, fraud statistics, for example, and they can use that data and analyse it in a different way. And there's loads of publicly available data out there, there that, you know, just look at the British Crime Survey, that students can interrogate in a way that perhaps not been looked at before. So looking at, you know, gender variables or variables of, of, of age, for example, on particular issues. So that's secondary analysis. Thirdly, case study research. So students can look at a particular topic, but then have one chapter that's on a specific example of that. So if they wanted to look at, I don't know. See, I'm th I don't know why I've got serial killers on the brain this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm sitting over here. <laughs> <laughs> if they wanted to look at perhaps an aspect of policing, and then they wanted to look at how it had been utilised in a particular police force, they could have an example of that from a particular uh, in one particular chapter. If they wanted to look at miscarriages of justice as a topic for their dissertation, they could choose one case and study it in detail <coughs> in one chapter, which would then be used as an example for the whole dissertation. So case study research can be quite interesting. And finally, really importantly, is the literature review. Yes. And students often think that's well, a slightly uh, less impressive form of dissertation. It's absolutely not. It is an analysis of the literature that's already out there, that's already published, and students are gathering the evidence for their own purposes. All of the evidence is out there. We talked about this with Linda and Gordon this morning. And then assembling that evidence to answer their particular research question. I think that's really important because, certainly from my experience, that, that there's this assumption that lots of students have that if they're not doing primary research, then somehow they're not going to get as good a grade mm. if they do something else. And that's a, a complete misnomer. That's completely wrong. A really good literature review um, can, can achieve uh, the same grades, higher grades, um, than, than, than a reliance on mm. um, primary research. And of course, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to go and do primary research. You, know, you might even think it's, it's, it's more interesting um, at, at the outset. But, but you've also got to think about the other pressures that are going on in, in, in your lives. And, and if you're not doing primary research, you know, it's not going to necessarily mean that you're going to get a worse grade or you're not going to do as good in your uh, a piece of work for your, for your dissertation, but it does allow you to have greater control over mm. the things that you are doing. Mm. You're not dependent on um, um, other people doing um, uh, uh, things for you. You're not dependent on, or well, you can lose that anxiety of what if I only get 10 responses and I've mm. sent out 100 questionnaires. And that those levels of anxiety, if you've got other things going on, yeah. are quite, quite often worth thinking about. Yeah, because often students will say, well, I want to do a dissertation on... I don't know, the introduction of uh, increased levels of police community support officers. And then they'll say, I'm going to go and ask students what they think of PCSOs. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> not that we don't care, but I'm not sure that that really helps us to answer the question about the utility and effectiveness of PCSOs if we ask students what they think of them. So sometimes doing primary research can actually demean a dissertation, I think, yeah, rather absolutely. than enhance it. Absolutely. So a good literature review also gives students the opportunity to really go into depth on a topic. Because if you're doing primary research, you've got to have a methodology chapter, yep. you've got to report on your findings, and, and you've got to do your analysis. So you haven't really got room to cover much of the literature, so it's got to be a really well-crafted early couple of chapters in order to get all of that information in. But if you decide to do literature review as your whole dissertation, you can really expand and go into depth and provide a really good piece of work. Mm. So the issue, you've mentioned a couple of times, the issue of chapters. Um, mm. um, one, of, one of the things that I, I sometimes find um, that students say is that the idea of having four chapters, three chapters, five chapters, whatever, um, uh, there's a tendency at the outset to say, well, actually, this is like writing four essays, mm. and I'll put them together. But it's not. It, the important thing is to remember that, that it's one piece of work mm. that can take different shapes, which leads me on to my next question, which is, how do you structure a dissertation? Logically. Ah, always a good idea. <laughs> and chronologically, I would say. <coughs> Nathan, I've drawn a picture for you this morning. Now, I, I, even I know you haven't drawn that. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, I've, I've produced this because often I get blank looks when I talk about an egg timer. And I, I think, you know, with mobile phones, I'm not sure people need an egg timer anymore. But this is an egg timer. And the reason that I've printed this off is because I think it's a useful example of what the shape of a dissertation could look like. Yeah. Because in writing your dissertation about police 
culture, for example, you need to start, uh, say police culture and a firearms department, uh, you need to start off quite broadly to introduce the area because you've got to imagine that your reader doesn't know anything. You're not writing it for an expert in the area. Mm -hmm. So you need to start off quite broad. Why is it important that we look at this issue? Well, we need to understand a bit about the background to policing, yep. a bit about the background to why police culture is important, a bit about why understanding police culture is important to understanding how police officers operate on the street. So we need those kind of introductory chapters about policing and about police culture before we start to narrow the focus here where we start to look at specialist departments like a firearms department, then we might do our research on the firearms department, what we find out about police culture we'd report about here, and then we broaden out again towards the end, we talk about what does this mean for policing more generally. So although your topic area might be narrow, looking at poli uh, police culture within a firearms team, actually your dissertation as a whole needs to be quite broad, narrow in, and broaden out again. Which is why if you split it into chapters, quite distinct chapters, you can then make it a logical and chronological account of police culture. And of course it's important as you go through to signpost the reader back to things that you said in, uh, and forward to things that you said in other chapters mm. as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Because um. if you, we talked about <coughs> signposting earlier with Gordon actually, ah, how right, important okay. it is. I love the way he talks about it in terms of train announcements, you know, that you've got to make that announcement so people know what's coming next and what's come before. And we talked about it being really important in an essay, but in a dissertation, it's absolutely crucial. Because by the time your readers read six, seven thousand words, they can't remember what they read at the beginning. They need to be reminded constantly of what's coming, what's been before, and why it matters. But the signposts in a dissertation probably need to be more reliable than the signposts in a, on a rail. Possibly. <laughs> I'm not mentioning any rail companies by name. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so that, that's, that's, that's really useful. So we've, we've talked about ideas. We've talked about research questions. We've talked about um, different types um, and structures. Supervisors. Mm. Supervisors are absolutely crucial yeah. to the dissertation. And I'm sometimes worried, although I do try and spell it out to students, that they don't realise that the supervisor is there for them to work with them throughout the process of their dissertation. Yes. And our distance learning students have their supervisors for quite some time as they're completing their dissertation process. So use your supervisor. Get in touch with the supervisor right at the early stages. Work out what the plan's going to be. Work out with your supervisor your aims and objectives your research methods, how are you going to research a particular topic, but also importantly what your chapter breakdown is going to look like. You can write all that on one piece of A4, yes. send that to your supervisor and say, what do you think? Mm. Because it's always, and you must find this as well, it's always frustrating when, when students don't use the advice of their supervisor, don't contact them, and then you get a dissertation that's sent in that doesn't have an introduction, or it's made up of 14 sections, <laughs> yes. or yeah. that they've, you know, I had one student a couple of years ago who did the most fantastic research but just produced the results, didn't analyse those results, which was a real shame because yeah. they haven't been in touch. So supervisors are there all the way through to help with that process. And it's it's a service as well that's, that's, that's there that mm. needs to be taken advantage of. And, I, and, yeah. and you're right, I think getting in touch with your supervisor at the earliest opportunity, even if you, you, you get in touch and, and it's just to say hello and introduce yourself, mm. and, and even if your first um, sentence to them is, I don't know what I want to do, mm. y you've got that time and space to do that and you can work with your supervisors yeah. and they will be happy to, um, to, 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 to engage and to, to bounce ideas around. Yeah. And, and sometimes I find that you know, the first six weeks or so you're going backwards and forwards with ideas and, mm. uh, and some of those will change, and, and, but gradually it just starts to come together. Yeah. Once uh, students are clear <laughs> on these are my four chapters that I'm going to be looking yes. at or however many chapters it's going to be, supervisors happy with them then you know you can go off and work on your own a little bit. Yeah, and I, th I, I think it's important to get over any anxiety that people might have about making that contact. If you don't really know what you want to do with your dissertation, that's not a good reason not to get in touch with yeah. your supervisor. You know, you've, you'll have done um, um, some stuff around your proposal, you'll have some ideas, but, but it's about shaping those. And, and actually, I find um, with students that it's very useful, once, as you say, once you start working out what the chapters are going to be, that it suddenly looks manageable. Yes. When it's on a sheet of of paper and you've broken down what your chapters are you might have some draft headings for those and you start then to put little bullet points four or five things yeah. that are going to go into each chapter suddenly it becomes a little bit like join the dots yeah and, and you can see that penny dropping quite often it's no longer a massive task is no. it it's about writing the four chapters that are outlined and then making sure they all seamlessly go together absolutely absolutely so do get in touch yeah. with your supervisors um early say hello drop drop an email um email phone skype you know yep. just work out with your supervisor whatever's better and you can you know when you're on the phone to students and you work through that structure you can almost hear them smiling on the other end as they think ah, yeah. 
that's it. I can do Absolutely. that. I can and and that. the other important thing that if you're looking to break the ice is to let them know when you're going on holiday mm. and, and when they're going on holiday. And you get those things in your diary so you, you, know, you don't have um, any sort of panics or gaps when somebody's not around. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you've got questions or, or whatever. So, yeah. th you know, th those sorts of um, logistical issues are, are, are important. And supervisors, um, well. of course, also read drafts of chapters. Absolutely. So it's not like writing essays where, you, you know, you, you don't send a draft to your marker. You do with your dissertation, send draft chapters, one at a time, not all at once, one at a time to your dissertation. Supervisor. But it's always useful, actually, one of the things that I, I would always encourage um, students to do with supervisors is to agree draft dates for submission yeah. of chapters. So even though they're not hard and fixed and they, you know, there's not penalties attached to them like there are for other assignments, it gives you a little bit more of that structure that you can work to mm. and say actually you know on this date I know that I've got to have done this and then you yeah. can agree a return date for the feedback from yep. um, and then you, you can you can read through the feedback and, and have your, your tutorials mm. on that basis but um, uh, doing it over the period of time and making the most of the time available I think yes. is really important Absolutely. it's an advantage yeah um, definitely um, but it can be a disadvantage if you just think <laughs> it's a long way away I'll worry about it another day yeah <laughs> and it can be quite a slippery slope <laughs> okay so we've done all these things what makes a good dissertation well we we've I've got a couple of minutes on this, so I'm just going to have to rattle through, but really, really clear aims that are upfront in your abstract, that are upfront in your introduction, and you refer to them throughout. So this is what my dissertation is seeking to achieve, and you make sure that's really clear to your marker. Good coherence of argument. So you're making clear arguments that are coherent, and you are repeating them throughout your dissertation so that people are clear, your marker is clear, on what your argument is, and that it's coherent and logical uh, um, as well. Writing skills, obviously, really important in terms of presentational skills. Awareness of the literature. You know, if you don't know that something's just been just come out of the House of Commons, you need to. If you, you don't know about new legislation, you need to. So make sure you're really up to date, that you know the new stuff, that you know the classic stuff as well. Uh, level of critical analysis is really important, so that you're not just describing what's out there, but you're telling us why it's important. And that comes from more and more and more reading. And a strong conclusion. Strong introduction as well, because that's the first thing your mark is going to be reading. Is, yes. But a really, really strong <laughs> conclusion that really sums up what it's all about. Okay. So, just very quickly then, last point. Yeah. Um, What's an abstract? Because you, that's the one thing you have to do that you don't have to do for your other assignments. Abstract is a, is a tough one, as yep. you know. Yeah, so it's, know. The, it's the paragraph at the beginning that's usually in italics on a journal article that has to have what the topic is about, the aims, the objectives, the research methods, the findings, the conclusion, and why all that matters. So you've got to do all of that in a paragraph. It's the trickiest thing you'll ever write. Write it right at the end and send it to your supervisor for comment. Uh, but don't leave it too late, because you might have to do several drafts. Yes. Yeah. It's still, it's still the trickiest thing you have to write, I think, isn't well, it? Well, you're summarising uh, 10,000 words in a few hundred words, yeah. and, and the readers need to be able to understand everything they need to know mm. about whether they want to read the rest of your um, dissertation um, just from, from, that, from that summary. Yeah. So I think the advice really is to keep reading lots of um, abstracts from journal articles um, and, and just see how they're pieced together mm. um, and, um, uh, 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 and make sure that you're kind of following the, the format of those that, um, that, yeah. that, that you find elsewhere. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Clear Pleasure. aims, keep in touch with your supervisor, all the rest of it. Absolutely. All the good tips. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Nathan. Uh, that was the final session of today's virtual study day. So thank you very much indeed for watching. It's not too late to uh, send your pictures to us on uh, Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Please use the hashtag ICJSVSD19. That's ICJSVSD19 with a photo of where you're watching the virtual study day today. And you could be in with a chance of winning the University of Portsmouth hoodie. Nathan, you can't send in a photo. We won't <laughs> let you have the prize. Uh, so thank you very much for your questions today. Thank you much for all being involved. Uh, thank you to the crew behind the camera, to Joe and to Sam and to Karen again for all of your assistance with running the virtual study day. And we look forward very much to seeing you next time on the ICJS sofa. Goodbye.